You've always had the dream of living on a sailboat and exploring the world under your own steam. And you've watched countless hours of sailing videos on YouTube when you should have been working. Your heroes are people from Delos and Atticus and Uma and Vagabond. And you want to finally pull the trigger, but it's so complicated. There's water makers and catch rigs, dinghies, fin keels, navigation, ASA classes, insurance. The whole idea seems daunting, but you aren't getting any younger. What is the absolute easiest way to do this thing while doing it safely? This week on Everything You Need to Know, how to go cruising in 2023. There are millions of hours of YouTube videos endlessly informing you on what you need to know to go cruising and what you don't need. And giving you a million things to think about that kind of make you feel like this whole thing is just too complicated. It's like analysis paralysis. But what is the bare minimum? What if we boil it down to the easiest possible way, not be the gatekeepers of this beautiful way of life of ours, and instead just give you the bottom line and you can use it like that or add some creature comforts if you want to. First, what is the easiest cruising to do? The easiest cruising is all about not reinventing the wheel and just doing what everybody else is doing. And that makes it really easy. Running in a pack if you want to and never having to be alone, the only boat. Safety in numbers. Luckily, the easiest path you can take to start your cruising adventure is also the most populated path. And it has a set schedule that you can follow. And that's from the North America's East Coast path in late summer, headed toward the beautiful and easiest cruising ground in the world, the Bahamas. You can start anywhere you want on the East Coast, and a popular choice is sometimes a start from Annapolis in early October at the Annapolis Boat Show. But the even easier thing to do is to start in Florida, which is conveniently where all the boats are for sale anyway. Buying a boat this summer is a fairly easy task in Florida, and you'll have until November to get it ready if you buy it now. Which boat you buy, though, is entirely up to your budget. But there is something for everyone, whether you want to spend 10 grand or 200 grand. It just has to be big enough to cross the Gulf Stream. I have a friend who does it solo every year on a 27 footer from the 1960s, so don't be too worried about the size of the boat. All you need is to be safe and comfortable and get something that you can afford. And remember, this episode isn't about how to do this comfortably, it's about how to do this easily. The easiest cruising plans in the world are pretty straightforward. You're going to hang out in Florida at the end of October and wait for all the other boats, the cruising sailboats, to show up as they do, and they'll do their final provisioning run. You make friends with those other sailboats and they'll show up and realize that you have the same intentions. Then in early November, when the weather is right, you'll cross either to Northern Bahamas or the really easy way to Bimini. You'll soak up Bimini for a few days or a few weeks, whatever you want, and then head for the islands around Nassau. When you're ready to leave there, you'll work your way down to Staniel Key, where you'll be spending Christmas on the cruiser's beach with the other cruisers and enjoying the Staniel Key Yacht Club's amazing fireworks show for New Year's. You'll dive down in the grotto that they used in the James Bond movie and swim with the nurse sharks if you're so daring. Then you'll work your way down the Exuma chain and swim with the pigs, play with the sea turtles in Farmer's Key, finally landing in Georgetown for the middle of February. You'll be with hundreds of other cruising boats, playing volleyball at the world famous Chat and Chill Beach, renting scooters on the mainland and going exploring every day. You'll even hike up Monument about once a week. You'll snorkel on the most beautiful reefs and learn to spearfish giant lobsters. And you'll be there in March for the Georgetown Regatta where you might even race your own cruising boat around the island and have a great time with all your new sailing friends that you'll have met on this journey. They'll be lifelong friends that you're going to fall in love with and you'll know them for the rest of your life. Toward the end of March, it's time to start heading back to safety as hurricane season sort of approaches. So you'll decide to leave probably the same time 10 other boats with the same plans as you want to go back. And you guys will work your way back up the islands, basically hitting every spot that you missed on the way down. 
finally landing in Florida in about late June. In all this time, you'll never need to sail at night. You'll never need to sail alone or be the only boat. You'll barely ever be out of sight of land, and it really is all that easy. And whatever boat you decide to buy, it won't need to be all that complicated. Lady K Sailing is brought to you by patrons, people who give a couple of bucks an episode to make these videos possible. The mission at Lady K Sailing has always been to get more people out sailing more easily. If you'd like to help out, please consider becoming a patron. What you're going to be doing to get a boat ready for the several months away from home is also pretty straightforward. There are a lot of things that you could buy and install and a lot of things that you could spend money on, but the bare minimum is our goal today. And you can add what you want to the list based on your budget. First, the big three, the utilities of a boat, if you will. And those are anchoring, fresh water, and electricity. First, the anchor. The rule is always to take whatever you think you'll need based on the size and weight of the boat and go one size bigger. I like to use this handy chart that Rockna provides. Based on this chart, my boat being of 35 feet and about 15,000 pounds, it advises me to buy the Rockna 33 pound or the, maybe the 44 Rockna. So I bought the 55 model and I can tell you firsthand, I'm very glad I did. If you want to sleep soundly at night at all, you buy the bigger anchor. And to support that anchor, you'll need chain. And in my case, the boat called for 5 16 chain. So I bought about 120 feet of it. The bare minimum, regardless of the boat, is about 100 feet. And you can follow that with another 100 feet of nylon anchor road. And trust me, it's very common to have over 100 feet of road out when you anchor most of the time. So having 200 feet of road in total is probably ideal. With the anchor sorted out on your new boat, we'll need fresh water. And while it is available, usually for free, at just about every island in the Bahamas, you do need to carry enough just in case. A hundred gallons is a nice number. I got by with about 60 gallons. And even then, with two people using it, we never ran short and we were actually able to skip filling up on some of the islands. If you are buying a smaller boat that doesn't have a 60 or 100 gallon fresh water tank, you want to carry some jerry cans and there's two sort of choices there. First, you can keep them up on the tow rail and you see this on every cruising boat. That's what most folks do. You buy the skinny standard five gallon jerry cans or you can keep them inside the boat somewhere that it's convenient to do so. And that way you can use the seven gallon square cans from Walmart. These obviously hold more, but they also stack very nicely because they're cubes. These are what I use. And lastly, we come to electricity. Living on a sailboat is full of the highest highs and the very lowest lows, the greatest adventure of your life and sometimes the most grueling. To give yourself the best odds of truly enjoying the experience, you have to try to remove any of the big stressors that you can ahead of time. That's why I bring up electricity. As a matter of safety, you'll need to have working lights and a working VHF radio. But as a matter of not going crazy on the day-to-day, -day, being able to have a fridge and plug things in to charge them makes a pretty huge difference. I found having the ability to also watch a movie was of pretty big importance. There are some days down there that are just miserable. It's raining, it's overcast, you don't want to be outside. You need a way to sit down and relax. Also, some cruisers spend all their time frantically watching the battery monitor and turning things off and on all the time. And for me, that ruins a lot of the experience. I came into living on a sailboat to be less stressed with day-to-day -day life and not worry about things like electricity. And maybe you can live without refrigeration. But if not, you'll want sort of as a minimum about 300 to 500 watts of power generation from solar and wind or a combination of the both and 200 amp hours of usable battery life. If they're lead acid batteries, 50% discharge, you'll need 400 amp hours total. For lithium, they discharge to about 20%, so you can aim lower. Having more than enough electricity is one of the biggest things that you can do to save yourself the stress of day-to-day -day living on a boat. Knowing you don't have to constantly check the battery monitor is amazing, and you'll thank me in the long run. Please don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. Both are free for you and would really mean the world to me. Also, if you could leave a comment below about what the next episode should be on. I get all the ideas from you guys. 
The last thing we're going to talk about on the bare minimum is the gear to install on your boat and to bring with you. Many folks refuse to leave without a sophisticated navigation system or AIS and radar and an EPIRB. But what do we really need? Genuinely, a compass is the bare minimum. But we can take it a bit further than that without much added cost. A solid compass is a must, but also is a solid depth sounder. I like Raymarine, but as long as what you have is accurate and reliable, it makes life livable when you're pulling in and out of anchorages, especially in the Bahamas where it's pretty shallow, trying to avoid the sandbars. Beyond the compass and the depth sounder, you need some sort of navigation, and there is a bare minimum for that too. A chart of the area is a must, and the ability for you to read that chart and use it to navigate, but also Navionics. And believe it or not, these guys don't pay me to talk about Navionics, though maybe they should. But it's just the cruising standard. Everyone uses it. Everyone speaks Navionics when they're talking to each other about navigating. You'll just want to have it. I bought two used iPads to run Navionics. I think I paid $250 for each of them. And both of them are still working today with some 12,000 nautical miles of navigation behind them. If you go iPad, just make sure you buy the cellular version because those ones have a GPS chip built right onto the motherboard. You get on the internet and you use Navionics to download the maps for your intended cruising ground and then you're ready to go. They also download active captain information so you'll be able to see comments from other cruisers at every location that you plan to visit, all without an internet connection. So with the compass, a chart, a depth sounder and Navionics of some sort, you'll have the bare minimum you need to go just about anywhere in the world that you might want to go. It really is that easy. And you can add all sorts of extra stuff if you want, but for the trip we're looking at, you're never going to sail at night, so AIS and radar are optional. You'll never need to sail in the fog or dangerous conditions if you make conservative decisions as the captain and decide to play it safe. The last thing you're going to need, and don't mess around with this, is a family car even if you're alone. You won't be able to get the boat to the grocery store or oftentimes the water spigot, so you need a dinghy. Some people manage just fine with a little rowboat, the smallest of small rowboats, but it does restrict what you can do. For me, a 10-foot rib is ideal with a 994 stroke or a Yamaha 15 two-stroke. I say Yamaha because in the Bahamas there are Yamaha dealers and service centers, so the Yamaha 15 two-stroke is super popular, it's really light, it always runs, it's really reliable. This dinghy will give you the ability to get off the boat for adventures, for provisioning, um, even when the water is choppy, which it usually is in the Bahamas. The person in the rowboat will have very limited times where they can actually use the rowboat without it sinking. A 10-foot rib with a 9.9 or a 15 will also plane up with two adults on board, meaning you can go a lot further than a rowboat and you can visit more locations that sailboats can't get to. You can also bet that everyone else will have one of these ribs and if you want to go to all the cool spots that they're going to, you're going to need one. And the motors are light enough to haul up on the sailboat and store and you can tow the dinghy behind you or do what most folks do, store it upside down on the forward deck. The internet and bookstores are full of advice on how to go cruising and do it safely and most of it is pretty good advice. But it's very important not to get bogged down with the how complicated it can all seem. Some people seem to want to gatekeep and tell you all the reasons you can't possibly do it. But in the end, humans have been plying these waters for thousands of years before YouTube, before cruising guides, before fancy electronics and aft cabins and sugar scoops. All that truly matters is that you do it before you can't anymore. That's it for this week, guys. If you need help and you want to book an hour of my time buying a boat, head over to ladyksailing.com forward slash consults. Until next time, keep the heavy side down, but not too far down. We'll see you.